2022 has been a fantastic year for fiction. There have been some truly incredible books released and some utterly terrible ones. But that's okay, the Booker Prize judges won't be watching this video. I've read 97 books released this year, but there are some big name books I have not got to yet. Nonetheless, it's time to separate the chaff from the cream. I understand farming. At number 22, I'm staying with my accent. It is Diana Reed's second novel, Seeing Other People. A queer romance novel involving a love triangle with four people. I understand shapes. Our triangle has three women, one man, and two sisters. Set just after lockdown is ending, this novel captures that messy dating feeling of today's teens and 20-somethings. I feel like this novel can be summed up with the question, what happens if you, like the girl your sister is casually sleeping with? Now, if you're an international viewer, you probably won't be able to get a copy of this book yet. But don't worry, Diana Reed's first novel, Love and Virtue, has just been released overseas. And it's absolutely sublime. If I had have counted that as a 2022 release, it would have made this list's top five. At number 21 is The Colony. In 1979, on a small island off the west coast of Ireland, an English artist and a French linguist visit an isolated community. The linguist wants to study how the Irish language is changing the artist to find inspiration, reignite his career, and paint something. And we're left with this constant question, will the troubles reach this isolated community? While the French and Englishmen become very clear metaphors for English colonialism in Ireland, I think that McGee is great at relating this story back to her characters. The housekeeper may read and her 16-year-old son and how the situation affects them. Despite the metaphor, they're real, real people. And this is a chilling book. At number 20 is Isabel Beach's debut novel, Sunbathing, a book about grief and recovery told in stunning prose. A woman travels to Italy a week after her father kills himself to visit friends before they marry. The novel is almost plotless, focusing on the mundane things, picking fruit from an orchard, cooking dinner. And through it, we not only get this depiction of grief and regret, but hope and of reconnecting with one's self. Number 19 is the Scottish novel Ginger and Me. We know that Wendy is going to jail, but we don't know why this 20-year-old aspiring author and bus driver who has a state-sponsored social worker after the death of her parents has ended up there. She thinks there must have been some mistake. Don't they know she has to drive the bus on Monday? Wendy has two friends, Ginger, a 15-year-old girl with street smarts, who is the victim of both poverty and abuse at home and often wants to stay with Wendy to run away from her problems and Diane Weston, a local famous author who has hearted several of Wendy's comments on her Twitter post. As we learn why Wendy ends up in jail, this book takes us to some really dark places that Wendy just doesn't understand. Stalking, rape, self-harm. This book is like a really dark version of Eleanor Oliphant. Number 18 is Night Crawling. A lot has been made about just how young the author of this novel, Layla Motley, was when she wrote this, 17. And it tackles topics like poverty, police corruption, and prostitution. Big topics for a 17-year-old. But this is just such an emotionally complex novel that will make you scared, sad, and angry at various different points in the novel. Kiara lives with her brother who refuses to work and focuses on his rap career instead. And a young boy who used to live next door but was abandoned by his mother. Their rent has doubled and then one night Kiara is mistaken for a prostitute. At 17 is a terrible kindness. William has just qualified as an embalmer when an emergency call comes in. The 1966 Aberfan mine disaster in Wales has just happened and seeing so many 
dead children has a profound effect on William. It isn't William's first time in Wales. As a child, he went there to study as part of a prestigious boys' choir, and we know that the events around there are the reason that he is estranged from his mother, but that he also had an amazingly strong friendship with one of the boys. A really beautiful and emotional novel that is really just about love. At number 16 is the funniest book on the list, No Hard Feelings. This book is advertised as sorrow and bliss meets flea bag with a splash of Dolly Alderton. I would say that this does have a very sorrow and bliss feel to it, but it's a sorrow and bliss that doesn't take itself very seriously and takes the time to ruthlessly mock all the characters in the novel, but only the characters that you like. Penny is overworked, underpaid, and probably hungover. Her boyfriend Max is emotionally unavailable and often physically unavailable too. Even her therapist is having a go at her. Penny's support network are two besties, Beck, who has just gotten engaged and doesn't have as much time for Penny as she used to, and Anne, who is just so organized and successful. How does she find the time to hook up with a new girlfriend and listen to Penny cry? And then there's also Penny's roomie, a man slut named Leo, who has responded to breaking up with his girlfriend of five years by bedding every gorgeous girl within walking and sometimes cycling distance of their shared house. A romantic comedy that tackles depressions and feelings of inferiority, bad bosses, and finding your place in the world. This book has really nailed the Aussie sense of humour. 15 is Wahala by Nikki May. This follows three best friends, three Anglo-Nigerian women at different stages of their lives, dating very different men. Ronki wants her new guy to be the one and to have 2.3 children with him. Boo has everything Ronki wants, but she's unfulfilled and wants to remember who she used to be. And Simi, who despite her perfect life, is crippled with imposter syndrome. Her husband thinks they're trying for a baby. They are not trying for a baby. Then Isabel happens. She explodes into the group, bringing the best out of each woman, but also causing cracks in their friendship. This is a real soap opera of a novel that manages to look at friendship, racism, career, culture, and the lives of Anglo-Nigerian women. 14 is Send Nudes by Saber Sams, the debut short story collection that explores female sexuality in all of its various forms. There are 10 stories and every protagonist from every story is somehow different. We have a fat woman, a gay woman, an older woman, but in many ways, they're very, very similar. This collection really explores the transactional nature of sexuality and asks the question, what do women get out of it and why are they even participating in it? it creates a rich, tapestry of womanhood in today's world. 13 is love marriage. Yasmin is 26, training to be a doctor like her father. She is engaged to Joe, whose mother Harriet is a famous feminist and deeply entangled in his life. As the wedding draws near, Yasmin starts to have doubts about her future, both as Joe's wife and as an aspiring doctor. Yasmin's brother has disappointed her father by going off and making documentaries for a living, and Yasmin doesn't want to do the same. This is a book that gets increasingly more and more complex. At times it's funny, and at other points it's moving, and it explores sexuality, parent-child relationships, racism, art, and expectations, among other things. Things. And number 12 is the Aquakia Maisie novel, You Made a Fool of Death with Your Beauty. Faye is a talented artist, but the love of her life died in a car crash five years ago. Her best friend Joy is pushing her to date again, but it's not the dating side of dating that Joy wants to help Faye with. There is so much more to this novel than what I have mentioned, but it's a very plotty book, and a lot of the joy of reading it is seeing the various direction it goes in. Amazie is able to explore themes of toxic masculinity, bisexuality, acceptance, father-son relationships, overcoming grief, and measuring up to past perfect love. The Immortal King Rayu comes in at number 11, a dystopian novel about a young Dalit man who has become CEO of the world, told from the point of view of his daughter, Athena. Athena has had 
King Raoul's memories implanted into her mind. She is living in the outskirts of the present world and has joined a rebel group. The contrast between historical and modern timelines shows us where the world is heading. The best dystopians are really always talking about our world, the world that we are physically living in. And you can really see the political criticism of our current system, the critiques of neoliberalism and where that is taking us. But also, this book is really speculative. The technological advancements in this world are all things that are currently being researched, they're currently being worked on, or they physically exist right now. This book is both speculative and literary, giving it such a broad appeal. We're into the top 10. If an Egyptian cannot speak English, an Egyptian American woman arrives in Cairo for the first time ever, and she meets a young unemployed photographer with a cocaine addiction whose mother has recently put her head in an oven. A really dark romance ensues, which allows Nanga to explore ideas around power, money, race, gender, drugs, domestic violence, grief, slavery, corruption, religion, culture, desire, fitting in and standing out the global or economic North and South divide, and so much more. This has quite an unconventional fourth wall breaking ending to it, which won't be to everybody's liking. But for me, it serves to illuminate the complexity of what Nunga was writing about, forcing me to reconsider my interpretation and ultimately to help me see the richness of ideas that she was trying to communicate within some of her simplest scenes. People Person is Candace Carthy Williams' second novel. Dimple has four half-siblings. She knows of them but doesn't have much to do with them. An aspiring social influencer with a far less than perfect boyfriend. At 30, Dimple feels alone, isolated and sad. Then a traumatic event brings her together with her half-sibling, and it serves as a way to bring these people very close together, but to also have them fight, just like family does. They also reconnect with Cyril, their rather disappointing father, and it explores a range of complex issues. Racism, being black, distrust of the police, jail time, domestic violence, sex tapes, exploitation, and much more. But where this book really works is in the characters, that Candace Carthy Williams has drawn. It feels like one of those novels where you have the situation and you have the characters, and once that's set up, it's this big, beautiful chain reaction. And that maybe she didn't know what theme she was going to write about, she was just going to do whatever was appropriate from her starting point. And number eight is The Marriage Portrait by Maggie O'Farrell. Lucrezia de Medici was just 16 when she died, Rumours at the time were that her husband murdered her, and this idea was popularised in the 19th century by the poet Robert Browning. Whether this is true or not, we don't actually know. Oryx aside was definitely a thing that happened in Renaissance Italy, and O'Farrell's historical fiction is writing about such women. In Lucrezia, O'Farrell has created a very intelligent young woman who doesn't fit into the world around her, and who is treated as a commodity by the men in her life, but she refuses to understand her lack of worth and doesn't accept her mistreatment. It is such a wonderful character portrait of a lady or a girl the history books don't have a lot to say on. Her childhood, her marriage, her love of drawing, and the incident where her father acquired a tiger for their menagerie. Young Mungo is number seven on the list, the follow-up to Douglas Stewart's Booker Prize winning novel Shuggy Bane, and I think this one is even better. Set in 1980s Glasgow, Mungo is a young queer boy with an older brother and sister, no father and an alcoholic mother. It does sound very much like Shuggy Bane, but Stewart then takes it in a completely different direction. For a start, Mungo actively has a boyfriend. His brother is involved in sectarian gang violence and his sister is sleeping with a much older man. And then there is this camping trip. Mungo's mum has organised this to help him become a man. But it is feeling more and more off the more you read about it. This book is dark, this book is emotional and it confirms Stuart as one of the most talented writers of his generation. And number six is Honour. Smitter and Indian 
American journalist returns to the one place she never wanted to visit again, India. She's been asked to report on Meena, a Hindu woman who has been attacked by members of her own family for marrying a Muslim man. This is a world where tradition and caste mean more than love and family. But this isn't just a tale of two women. This is also the story of the society that allows this to happen. And it discusses things like police corruption and the value of women. This is such a beautiful and human novel. Top five and its glory, a political satire that has been called the African Animal Farm, which if I'm honest is completely unfair on both books. Yes, they're both political satires that are retellings of famous coups. And yes, they're using animals in the place of humans. But in terms of style, they're so different. Glory is not a fable. It is not simple. It's using humor and repetition. It is so funny. It is so funny in an almost very Russian style when you realize that this farcical and comical situation Bulawayo is writing about and mocking actually happened, you don't know whether to laugh or to feel sad about it. I also want to take this moment to respond to some of the criticism of this book I've seen, which is basically saying that they don't think the animals add anything. It almost always comes with an explanation that Jadata is Zimbabwe and the old horse is Robert Mugabe. But if that was really the case, why didn't Bulawayo just call them Zimbabwe and Robert Mugabe? Why did she include the fictitious names in the book? It's because the story of Jadata and the old horse might closely follow Mugabe and Zimbabwe, but it could be any country, that it's not that unusual, that it's not a one-off atrocity, and that Bulawayo wanted to explore the levers, the mechanisms, the structures of corruption. Glory is the kind of book to have you laughing and then promptly feeling ashamed that you're laughing and that you didn't consider the humanity of the situation. It is such a clever, clever political satire. Factory Girls by Michelle Gallum looks at three girls who have just finished high school at the very end of the Troubles in Ireland. She manages to capture this weird, war-torn but normal setting. Soldiers pointing loaded guns at these girls as a friendly way of saying hi. The IRA is there very much to be feared but also to negotiate with. But Maeve, Aoife and Caroline want to go to university. They want to dance and get drunk. They want to explore how they feel about boys. You're sort of wondering, how do they find the time to worry about such things when they could literally die in a car bombing that evening. Awaiting their results to see which university they get into, the three Catholic girls take up a job in a local clothing factory, a place that employs both Protestants and Catholics. This novel explores feminism and class, it explores sectarian divides in Ireland, and most importantly, it explores what it feels like growing up on the border of Ireland and Northern Ireland during a time of great violence. Top three, and it's Moses McKenzie's and Olive Grove in Ends. Sayon Hughes is a member of the infamous Hughes family, a family deeply involved in the drug trade around Bristol. He is desperate to live a better life with Shona, the girl he has loved since high school. His cousin, Cuba, or as he's better known, Midnight, is his best friend and partner in the drug business, which Shayon is on the verge of quitting when one night he witnesses an altercation between Cuba and a rival gang. Books like this often focus on the violence of the situation, because the situation is very violent. But an Olive Grove in Ends certainly makes you aware of the role violence plays in the life of their characters. But it isn't the focus. Instead, what we get to see is the various relationships Shanon has, not just with his girlfriend and cousin, but with her father, with his friends who own a bakery, with his mother. And it is a much more effective way at demonstrating why these men feel trapped in this world. And it in turn adds to the understanding of the violence in these sort of novels. Religion also plays a massive role in this book. Shayon only feels that he can be Christian, Muslim or Rasta. I feel like mentioning religion might put some people off, but it's not preachy, it's just a character portrait. And I think it's a wonderful addition that adds complexity to Shayon. 
and to various different members of the community. But it also demonstrates how religion can both be used as a force of good and a force of evil, or as something somewhere in between. Number two is Maps of Our Spectacular Bodies. Maddie Mortimer's debut novel is about a mother and daughter relationship where the mother, Leah, has terminal cancer. Told over two timelines, one where Iris, the daughter, is 13 and Leah is in her 30s and being treated for her cancer, and the other when Leah is Iris's age. I think the dual timelines are a real risk because they're very similar characters Leah and Iris, and you can almost feel them blend together. But I'm really at a loss as to how Mortimer managed to keep these characters distinct. When Leah is doing something, you're almost thinking, man, this is such typical Iris behavior. Leah and Iris very clearly love one another. It is such a wonderful relationship, which in comparison makes all the other loving relationships look very different. And may I remind you that this is a terminal illness. The strong relationship between these characters makes what's about to happen so much sadder. But this is so much more than just an emotional tearjerker. There are themes around the changing role of young women in the world. We're looking at what makes us who we are, how much of us is in our parents, what happens after we die, the role of religion and spirituality in our lives, and also in how we cope with grief and uncertainty, the various types of love, what makes you a parent, the importance of fitting in and of being yourself. This is such a wonderful book, which could have been considered great for many different reasons. It is very hard to find a novel that is better than this, but you know, I just think I might have. I don't understand why more people aren't yelling the name Jessica Andrews just randomly in public. Why isn't this author better known? She is such a rare talent producing lovely, lovely books. Milk Teeth is number one. Andrews' prose is just so beautiful, combining sparse simplicity with glorious beauty. I feel like every sentence is working overtime. Andrews is aware of her characters, her setting, her themes, and each sentence must add to all three. This is literature that should be behind glass and hung in a museum. The simple story of a woman growing up in Durham, moving to London, meeting a boy, falling in love, having him move away to Barcelona and following him. But that is a story that could so easily center the boy. A woman talking about a man doesn't pass the Bechdel test. And yet, it does. It centers her, her sense of self, her fear, her ideals. Told in short sections lasting about two pages each, we flick between the modern story and events in her past. And this allows for a complex narrative around many of the themes, such as her relationship with her own body and food, contrasting her eating food five chocolate bars for lunch to gross out her fat phobic friends, to her skipping meals to intentionally shrink, to using poverty as a diet, to worshipping the size zero models on her bedroom walls, to feeling good at being complimented about her tiny waist, yet feeling yucky about her big boobs. The various settings really come through too. Should Andrews have wanted to move a scene from Barcelona to London, she would have had to completely rewrite it. The prose would need to be completely different to reflect the setting. A coming-of-age novel that explores self-worth, self-worth within a relationship and self-worth within your body, relationships with friends and with family, Cancer, chocolate, moving, poverty, absent parents, good mothers, miscommunication, and the sacrifices we make for the ones we love, the sacrifices that we don't mention, and the resentment that that can cause. This is my best book released in 2022, and that is my 22 best books of 2022. Please let me know what your favourite books released this year were. Did I miss any? Now, undocumented research shows that people who are subscribed to this channel are significantly better looking. So make sure you've signed up. 
And I've reviewed a bunch of these books in standalone book reviews, and I've placed them all together in a playlist here. If you're interested, click on it and enjoy. Bye-bye.